Welcome to this video tutorial. My name is Felix, I'm an Associate Principal Scientist and today we're going to look at the new oligonucleotide model that SimSip released in version 23 of its simulator. First, we're going to look what are therapeutic oligonucleotide drugs and then we're changing into the simulator and we'll show you the key considerations that you need to take when you would like to develop an oligonucleotide model in SimSip version 23. Generally, there are two different types of oligonucleotide drugs. We can have on-descent oligonucleotides, uh, ASO in short, which consists of a single DNA strand, and we can have double-stranded RNA, silencing RNA, as iRNA in short. Oligonucleotides have typically short strands, around 20 mers, uh, but there is no strict definition for those. And both can modulate the mRNA. The difference is in the way they start to modulate the mRNA because there are different pathways and we have to consider this when we want to develop a pharmacodynamic model. So what are the benefits? The benefits of an oligonucleotide drug is that any protein can be targeted. It's very simple to develop once the target mRNA is known and the properties are typically well conserved within a chemical class. So that makes them predictable. However, there are also certain challenges, because how do we reach a sufficient intracellular concentration? An oligonucleotide drug consisting of 20 different nucleotides is a large molecule and is a polar molecule, so it cannot just diffuse through the cell membrane. What is a challenge for us as modelers is that we have uncertainty of intracellular processes, and I will come back to this later when I show you the considerations in the simulator. And another issue is, because it's a relatively new class of therapeutics, we have a lack of experience and we have a lack of assays to understand some of the processes that are important. Some of the key characteristics of an oligonucleotide drug is a very rapid plasma clones. So you can see here in this example that within the first 24 hours we have like a two-fold in the log scale uh, decrease in the plasma concentration. And this rapid plasma clearance comes from the distribution into tissues. So we have a high tissue distribution in the first 24 hours, as you can see on the right-hand side, where it primarily goes into the liver or into the kidney. Generally, we have slow degradation by nucleases that are distributed everywhere in our body. And the main pathway for elimination is through the kidney. All those characteristics are similar for ASOS and siRNA, so we can develop a common PK model for both of them. So why do you want to use modeling and simulation for oligonucleotide drugs? What we can do, we can predict how much of the oligonucleotide reaches the intracellular space, reaches the target site. We can also simulate what is the tissue concentration. We can link it to a pharmacodynamic effect. We can look at the impact of conjugation if you're having a conjugated oligonucleotide drug. We can look what is the disposition after we dose the oligonucleotide subcutaneously. And we also can look at so-called special populations, populations with limited clinical data, such as, for instance, people with renal impairment or people with hepatic impairment. And with this short introduction, we will now switch into the simulator and see how can we develop an oligonucleotide model. So now we, have, we are in SimSub version 23. So what we do now is to generate a new oligonucleotide file by clicking on File, New, New Compound. So you have the option here in the middle to uh, develop a new oligonucleotide molecule, which we will accept. We have to give it a name. The scheme of different screens is similar to what we have for small molecule and large molecule drugs. So we define first the physical properties, uh, then we go into distribution, elimination, and we will also have a look at the receptor-mated endocytosis model, RME in short. The first decision that we have to do for an oligonucleotide drug is to select the oligonucleotide type. So here we have two choices, antisense oligonucleotides and siRNA. And I will show you what are the differences between the two, because the PK, as we have seen, is similar, but the PD is different. The second 
uh, decision is whether we want to simulate a conjugated oligonucleotide drug or not. So that enhances some of the screens because we have now also to define the properties for the conjugate. A very important parameter is the molecular weight. Because in the model we are operating with the two poor hypothesis and we are also using the renal filtration model. Both need the site of the molecule. And the size of the molecule is determined by the hydrodynamic radius, which can be calculated from the molecular weight of the oligonucleotide drug. So the molecular weight, or more precisely, the hydrodynamic radius, are very important parameters in modeling the distribution and elimination of an oligonucleotide drug. If you have a measured value for the hydrodynamic radius, this is quite preferred because there can be some divergence between the empirical relationship where we calculate hydrodynamic radius for molecular weight and the observed data. So if you open the padlock, we can start to modify the value and we can say it is maybe 1.6 uh, and that will be automatically taken by the simulator. We also have to define the molecular weight of the conjugate. So here in this case we have a default value for the uh, gall neck conjugate, which is the most uh, prominent one. All the uh, approved SIRNAs are gall neck conjugated. And gall neck binds to the hepatic uh, azeoglucamine receptor uh, that are on the hepatocytes of the liver and increase the uptake into the liver. What we also have is the molecular weight of the conjugated oligonucleotide drug because we're simulating now two different species. We're simulating the conjugated oligonucleotide and we're simulating the unconjugated oligonucleotide. So both are distributed, both can be eliminated and therefore we have the hydrodynamic radius for the two. What is also very important is the fraction unbound in plasma because oligonucleotide drugs follow the sticky hypothesis. They stick to all proteins that are available. In the exocellular water, in the plasma, it would be mainly albumin because it's the dominant protein there. But there can be all sorts of other proteins where an oligonucleotide drug binds to. So we can define here our fraction unbound in plasma. And that means now we're simulating four different oligonucleotide species. We're having the unconjugated oligonucleotide that is not bound to albumin. We're having the unconjugated oligonucleotide drug bound to albumin. And we're having the same for the conjugated oligonucleotide drug. Why is this important? Well, albumin has a molecular weight close to like 7, uh, 70,000 Dalton. And an oligonucleotide drug, as you can see, has a tenfold lower molecular weight. So that means we're increasing the molecular weight and we're increasing the hydrodynamic radius. And that will have an impact on the distribution and, all, and the elimination. If you're moving on now to the distribution screen, then you will see we only have the choice for a full PPK model. We haven't developed a minimum PPK model for oligonucleotide drugs. So you will have all the compartments that you know for small and large molecules, also for the oligonucleotide drug. This gives you the flexibility to set the target into any tissue that you like and to predict tissue-dependent concentration. Below here is a figure of a generic compartment to show you the different processes that are considered. If you're familiar with the large molecule model, you will see the model structure is quite similar to what we have for therapeutic proteins. So our generic compartment is divided into the vascular space, the endothelial cell layer surrounding the blood vessels, the interstitial space and the intracellular space. We have certain processes that we consider in the model. We have our blood flow uh, that brings the oligonucleotide into the compartment and the outflow considering also the lymphatic flow and the lymphatic system because oligonucleotide drugs are also uh, measured in the lymph nodes in preclinical species. What we are also using is the two pore formalism. So we have the convective pathway and the diffusive pathway through the small and large pores of the vascular endothelial. The two pore parameters are hidden here in this, uh, in, uh, in this section here. So this can be extended. We have all the parameters shown here that are shown here in the figure are shown here in this drop down menu. So you have your vascular reflection coefficients uh, and you have your uh, permeability uh, surface uh, clearance that describes the, the diffusion of the molecule. Please note that the values are quayed out 
for most organs, except for bone, because it's modeled as a well stirred organ, as it doesn't have any lymph flow, because it depends on different parameters. It depends on the lymph flow and on the pore sizes that you can find in the population, and it depends on the hydrodynamic radius that we discussed on the FISCHEM screen. So those values need to be changed rather than changing the calculated value, because then we don't know which parameter affects the calculation. What we also consider is the uptake rate from the vascular and the interstitial space into the endothelial cell, and also an unspecific uptake rate into the intracellular space. This uptake rate consists of different processes. First of all, it can be macropenocytosis, where we're taking up the surrounding fluid into the endosome, and with the surrounding fluid, we're also taking up our therapeutic oligonucleotide drug. It can also be the uptake by unspecific receptors. As I said, oligos follow the sticky hypothesis. They stick to every protein, so they can also stick to receptors at the cell surface, scavenger receptors, that are distributed everywhere in the body. Now, as a modeler, it becomes important, can we distinguish those two processes? Can we distinguish the endosomal uptake by macropenocytosis and by scavenger receptors? And at current stage, this is not possible, because we don't have any data. When people knocked out the scavenger receptors in animal models, there was no difference in the distribution uptake. So that means that probably the scavenger receptors are less important uh, for the distribution, for the intracellular distribution of oligonucleotide drugs. Or there are so many scavenger receptors that they can compensate. Another hypothesis is that oligos can bind directly to the membrane. So that means we're enhancing the numbers of receptors significantly because they can bind to all the lipid constituents that a cell membrane has. What we did in the simulator is we lumped it together into a single parameter, into a linear uptake rate called K-up. This K-up value can be found here in the lymphatic and cellular distribution pathway. Um, there were no experimental data for this uptake rate. There are no cellular in, uh, assays that can be used to get an idea about the uptake of an oligonucleotide drug into the cell. So what we have used is preclinical data tissue concentration from rodent species, and also liver concentration from the monkey. And our K-up values are fitted towards those data. So there is uncertainty in those parameters, and it would be highly appreciated if in vitro assays become available to measure the cellular uptake of an oligonucleotide drug. As oligos within a class have a similar PK, we believe that those values obtained from different oligonucleotides, from different antisense oligonucleotide drugs of second generation, can be used also for new oligonucleotide drugs to predict their distribution. Another important parameter is this redistribution rate that we also have here in this drop-down menu. This redistribution rate leads to a very long tail. So if you look at the plasma PK profile of an oligonucleotide drug, we have this very rapid drop of the plasma concentration, but then we have a very long tail with a long half-life of those oligonucleotide drugs. And those come from this redistribution rate that is much slower than the uptake rate into the cell. What we have done in the first instance is to use cell apoptosis data. And to use a hypothesis where we say, okay, if the cell, uh, if you have cell apoptosis, then the oligo distributes out of the cell again. However, we also use this data for uh, using in the fitting of the um, animal tissue data uh, to ensure that we are also capturing potential active exocytosis pathway of the cell. What we also have is the internalization rate of a specific receptor. And this is available for conjugated oligonucleotide drugs, and this is what we will see on the RME model. The other parameters we have here are the fraction unbound in the interstitial space and the fraction unbound into the intracellular space. And this becomes also very important, because following the free binding hypothesis, only the oligonucleotide drug not bound to any protein can um, have a pharmacodynamic effect. However, we don't know the fraction unbound in the intracellular space. There has been only one study showing that the fraction unbound is three to fourfold lower compared with plasma.
And that absolutely makes sense because the cytosol is typically densely packed with proteins and therefore we would expect very high protein binding in, uh, in the cytosol. Because we don't have any data, we just start with the assumption that it is equivalent to whatever is the fraction armband in plasma. But please be aware that this value could be different. When we move on to the elimination tab, then we see we have uh, different options. The first is non-specific clearance pathways. So what we have here for non-specific clearance pathways are the nuclease clearance. This is the total body nucleus clearance that we have. So we would require some stability data to have an idea how stable is our oligonucleotide drug and what is the degradation rate by nucleases, exo and endonucleases being combined together. We also have an additional systemic clearance, which is a linear clearance that takes the drug from the plasma compartment. It can be used, for instance, as an in vivo clearance if that is known. It can also be used to compensate for any other clearance processes that we're not accounting for. It can be interpreted as nucleus activity in plasma. And there's also a biliary clearance, because it has been shown, especially for gall neck conjugated oligonucleotide drugs, that they are also cleared via the feces. So there must be biliary secretion of, of the oligonucleotide drug. Unfortunately, the mechanisms are unknown, and if the mechanisms are unknown, we cannot develop any mechanistic model. So what we're having here is only a mean biliary clearance that takes the drug from the cytosol of the liver. What you see here below is the tissue contribution to nuclease clearance. So that separates this total body nuclease clearance to the different compartments. Those contributions are unknown. What we're using here is the values for therapeutic proteins. But keep in mind that the distribution of proteases can be different to the distribution of nucleases. So far we only know that the liver is the major organ for the degradation of oligonucleotide drugs. And this is fulfilled here in this tissue contribution. If a conjugated oligonucleotide drug is simulated, we can have a degradation or a deconjugation rate. And this deconjugation rate can be different between the extracellular water and the intracellular space. Here, by default, we're just assuming that we have deconjugation in the intracellular space in the acidic environment of the endosome. The renal filtration model is also based on the two pore hypothesis and is based on the hydrodynamic radius of our truck, or more precisely, on the hydrodynamic radius of our four different truck spaces that we're currently simulating. Our conjugated unbound oligonucleotide truck, unconjugated unbound oligonucleotide truck, the conjugated bound and the conjugated unbound oligonucleotide. The renal filtration model is always active by default, but it can be deactivated if required. There have been also attempts to measure the tissue metabolism, for instance, in human liver microsomes of oligonucleotide drugs. If those data are available, they can be entered here in this hepatic metabolism sheet, where there are different options. Just be aware that if you're entering the hepatic metabolism as HLM here, and you still have a total nuclease clearance with the liver, you're counting twice for the liver metabolism. Now we're moving into the receptor-made endocytosis model. This model becomes active if a uh, with conjugate is selected on the physical chemical screen. What we have here is, uh, first we're choosing the thriving concentration for the receptor-made endocytosis model. And the thriving concentration can be the free conjugated or the bound conjugated drug because it has been shown for gall neck conjugated oligonucleotide drugs that the receptor mediated endocytosis uptake is not impacted by uh, albumin binding. And that makes sense because albumin binds to the oligonucleotide drug whereas the conjugate binds to the receptor. So there seems to be no differences and therefore both are the thriving concentrations but they can be switched on and off. We can define here our receptor, so the only default receptor that we have is ASGPR uh, that is required for the gall neck binding into hepatocytes. But you can define your own receptors and a total of 10 receptors would be allowed in the population. You can select the location of the receptor expression, in this case we would select liver. And then we have a choice between different two different models. 
the full model for receptor mediated endocytosis that operates with K-on and K-off values or the causal equilibrium approximation that operates with a KD value. And in addition, we also need the internalization rate. And this internalization rate is a distribution pathway. It describes this pathway where we get the under truck into the intercellular space. So if you have a gallneck conjugated oligonucleotide truck, we would expect a higher uptake of the oligo from the interstitial space into the intracellular space of the liver. Now to the differences between ASUS and siRNAs. As I said, everything is similar. The only thing that we are accounting for is the binding to the risk complex in the intracellular space. And this can be found at the bottom of the distribution screen, where you have the option again between K on and K off values or a KD value for the binding between the siRNA to the risk complex. And this is sequence dependent, so this depends really on this RNA you're looking at. This data can then be used in the PD model. So if you're activating the PD model um, and we are selecting a comportment like, for instance, the liver, uh, then we can see that we also have the possibility to drive the PD effect by the siRNA to the risk complex. Regarding the trial design, there is no difference as compared with large molecule trucks. Uh, the only thing that is not enabled are multiple populations, and this is because of the receptor-made endocytosis model, as you would need to make sure that the same receptor is used at the same location in each of the populations. In terms of dosing, we have different routes of administration. These are IV, uh, first order, and there's also the subcutaneous absorption model that again operates with the two poor hypothesis to distinguish between lymphatic uptake and the direct uptake into the vascular space. As oligonucleotide trucks have typically a Tmax within hours, most uh, distributes into the vascular space um, of the, uh, uh, at the SC site and directly into the plot. However, if you have high protein binding, the uh, albumin-bound species would distribute preferentially into the lymph. So what can happen is that you have a double peak Tmax after a subcutaneous administration. First, with the unbound oligonucleotide truck going directly into the blood, and second, a peak of the albumin-bound that takes the lymphatic route. In terms of the outputs, uh, these are very familiar with the small molecule and large molecule outputs. There are just some specific outputs for the receptor mediated endocytosis model where we get the receptor parameters like the abundance and K on K off values being used. The same for the risk binding if you have an siRNA selected. And then we have the profiles of both uh, where we can see then the uh, concentration of the unbound receptor or the receptor complex and the same then for the risk profile. And that concludes this little uh, e-learning video for oligonucleotide trucks. I hope I could show you today that uh, what are the different considerations that we need to take when we want to simulate an oligonucleotide truck in SimSub version 23. The most important parameter are the hydrodynamic radius, or if this is not available, the molecular weight to predict hydrodynamic radius from molecular weight. We need to have an idea about the clones pathways. And if you have a conjugated oligonucleotide truck, we also need to know the receptor, the, its location, and the binding of the conjugate to the receptor. Thank you very much for watching this video.